Pirates had used ships that were fast. They had to get merchants and run away from pirate hunters. Their favorite vessel was the nimble sloop, a lightly armed sailboat. However, a lot of pirates favored full rigged ships such as heavily armed frigates that could both sail swiftly and batter the enemy with a fiery broadside. The brig has become a popular pirate icon because it theoretically merges the qualities of the sloop and the qualities of the ship. It is a medium between the two. It has two masts rather than two or three. It is fast but also resistant and has a decent balance in firepower. The truth was never this binary. Our conception of pirate tactics has been distorted by video games like Sid Meier's Pirates and Assassin's Creed. Some brigs had six cannons, while some sloops had twelve. Some of these cannons were five pounders, while others were light swivel guns mounted across the railing. Of course, no pirate cannon was heavy enough to actually pierce the hull of another ship. They were used for killing the enemy crew and destroying rigging. The sea battles seen in movies and computer games are pure fantasy. First of all, I'd like to mention that there are two Wikipedia articles on brigs, brigantines and the other ships discussed in this video. I will not be using Wikipedia as a source because it is notoriously unreliable and very easy to disprove. Also, most of the ship definitions from Wikipedia come from the late 18th century or even the 19th century, which is way way after the period that I cover on this channel, that being 1630 to 1730. Terminology changed and technology developed throughout the age of sail. So please, if you're going to tell me I'm wrong, feel free to do so, but provide your sources. I always include my literary sources in the video description, and some of them are even available online. In this video I will discuss a variety of two-masted vessels, that were both built and used in a virtually identical fashion. Rather than nitpicking petty details in naval architecture, I found it easier to just group them all into one class or family of vessels. This family was called Barquelongs by the French. In English and Spanish, Barque refers to a coastal boat used for trading and fishing. In French, Barque referred to a sloop. Sloops were light sailboats, single-masted and rigged fore and aft. Barque long essentially means long sloop. The basic Barque long was an open boat. Barque longs built with a deck were called double shallops and included the brigantine and corvette, the brigantine and brig, and finally the snow. Let's start with the basic Barque long. They were open boats built long and narrow. They had a low draft, allowing them to move through shallow waters. They had a sharp bow and stern, and one or two masts. They were typically 12 meters long, 2.5 meter broad, and 1 meter deep. They weighed 10 to 50 tons, and carried as many as a dozen oars. For example, Mathieu de Wolf commanded a 20 ton barque long called the Revenge. Since they didn't have a deck, they couldn't carry proper cannons, and had to rely purely on musketry or swivel guns. One barque long carried 10 swivel guns, for example. Before we proceed, I'd like to give a quick rundown on some rigging and ship terminology. I'll be dropping a lot of these terms throughout the video, so this part is to avoid confusion. For the purposes of this video, I'll use a brig as a reference. As you can see, it has two masts. The foremost mast is called the main mast. If the vessel had three masts, it, this mast would have been called the foremast. This horizontal mast at the front is called the bowsprit. Attached to it is the headsail. Headsail refers to any sail located ahead of the foremost mast. These square shaped sails are called square sails or broad sails. The biggest one on the main mast is called the mainsail. The small square sail at the top of the mast is called the topsail. The mast at the back is called the mizzen mast. This weirdly shaped sail is called the gaff sail. This type of triangular shaped sail is called a latin sail. With that out of the way, let's get into the different double shallops. Decked versions of the Barque Long were called the double shallops. The English brigantine falls under this class. The term brigantine derives rather befittingly from the word brigand, for plundering was in its blood. Like its predecessor, it had a long hull and fine lines. They varied in size. Some brigantines weighed only 15 tons, others weighed 200. Rovers rarely used double shallops that weighed over 100 tons, however, since the sail power wouldn't have been enough to compensate for the weight. Neither was it common for any of the double shallops to have a gun deck, like we see on the Jackdaw in Assassin's Creed. They had a cargo hold, a captain's cabin at the stern, and an open main deck where the cannons were mounted. What differentiated the brigantine from later version lies in the rigging. The brigantine carried only square sails on both of its masts. The main mast had a broad mainsail, 
and a topsail, whilst the mizzen carried only a single square sail. This simple rigging meant that it would have sailed best with the wind. If it sailed in a bad direction or in poor winds, they could just pull out the oars, which all of the backy longs carried. Since the brigantine had a deck, she was able to carry broadside cannons. I'll discuss the armaments of the double shallops later on in the video. Whilst the English called her the brigantine, the French referred to her as corvette. According to one priest who lived with the flibustiers, she was one of the vessels most used by them. Later on in the 1700s, corvette would refer to various auxiliary crafts and was adapted by the English navy as well, but that is irrelevant to this video. During the 1600s, corvette was simply a synonym for brigantine. Judging from period illustrations, it might be that the brigantine had three sails total and the corvette had four, a topsail on the mizzen as well. But aside from these scarce illustrations, I lack any written evidence to back it up. The definition of brigantine would also evolve during the age of sail. Whilst the brigantine of the 1600s and early 1700s was rigged only with square sails, the later brigantine would have a square rigged mainmast and a fore and aft rigged mizzen mast. I'm not sure when this change started to take effect. The brig evolved from the brigantine. The size of either ship never mattered. Some brigs were 200 tons, others 50. Some brigantines were 100 tons, etc. It is purely the rigging that separates them. Whilst the brigantine was entirely square rigged, the brig had a square rigged mainmast and a gaffer latin sail on the mizzen. Just like the corvette, the priest Labat listed it as one of the favorite ships of the flibustiers. However, rather confusingly, the French referred to the brig as brigantine. Basically, we have brigantine and brigantine existing simultaneously as different words for different ships. There were two definitions of the snow during the Golden Age. The first, called the Senau, was a Flemish bakelong with a smack rigging. Smacks were traditionally fishing boats. Flemish privateers in Franco-Spanish service were infamous in European waters and typically called Ostenders. The other and more common snow was a ship similar to the brig. It did not become a common sight in the Caribbean until the 1690s and is believed that snows before then were just referred to as brigs. Just like the brig, the snow had two masts and square mainsails and a square mizzen topsail. What separated it from the brig was that the gaff wasn't attached to the mizzen mast. Rather, it was attached to a small trisail mast located just behind the mizzen mast, allowing the mizzen yard or cross jack to be struck or lowered. Another distinguishing feature on the snow was that it usually carried a square sail on the cross jack yard. The cross jack yard is the lowest yard on the mizzen mast. However, in the mid to late 1700s, brigs would no longer be built with a latin sail, only a gaff sail, and a square sail would be added to the crossjack yard. This meant that during the late 1700s, the snow and brig were distinguished only by that weird little mast on the snow. How did the rover acquire his bakelong? No doubt, many of them were built in the New World for the specific purpose of privateering. After all, the English shipyards on Jamaica and Bermuda churned out high quality sloops intended for that purpose. Other barkelongs were now used for trading and fishing, and would be captured by pirates. At the Pearl Islands near Panama, Bartholomew Sharp and seven buccaneers captured a newly built brigantine, presumably used for shipping pearls. Whilst we see the jackdaw in Assassin's Creed engaging in great broadside battles with her cannons, real pirate brigs were not well armed. Charles Vane commanded a brigantine ranger, armed only with 12 cannon. Buccaneers like Mansfeld and Richard Sawkins sailed brigantines armed only with 4 cannon. Most of their heavy firepower would have been swivel guns. Charles Vane and his crew once debated whether they should engage a man of war or not. The French enemy was much larger and carried 24 guns, whereas Vane's brigantine carried only 12. Vane's crew argued that they could board her, and the best boys would carry the day. Vane himself argued that the brigantine might sink before they could get close enough to board. In the end he disengaged, considering it a suicide attack. Simply put, the armament of the Bacillon was obviously too small to permit an attack on any vessel of moderate size and armament, except by boarding. Bacillons often carried large crews. One of Bart Roberts' brigantines carried a crew of 140 men. These vessels were swift and light and perfect for running down merchants. Pirates such as Bartholomew Roberts used brigantines as auxiliary ships to nip at the heels of his prey until his flagship came up and battered them into submission with cannon fire. A distinct and often neglected feature of the Barquelongs were how excellently they sailed with oars. Captain Tolson, commander of the Mary Galley, noted how snows commanded by French filibusters rode very swiftly. In the end he was able to escape with the use of his own oars. All of the Barquelongs carried oars. 
On sailboats, oars were called sweeps or wooden topsails. They were stored amid ships or between the chains, rigging platforms protruding from the sides of the ship. If the ship was caught in calm winds, or if they needed more speed to pursue a prize, they would run out the sweeps from the oar ports, located between the cannons along the sides of the ship. The shallow draft and light build had other advantages. It made the backyelongs easier to careen and repair. Pirates did not have access to advanced shipyards, and intermittently they had to beach their ship, tilt it over, and scrape the hull clean of weeds and barnacles to improve speed. Their construction also allowed them to escape from pirate hunters. When Charles Vane escaped from New Providence Island, he was able to outrun the two navy sloops sent after him. Perhaps in terms of speed, the brigantine might have been superior to the sloop. Whilst we might imagine the brig as one of the most prominent pirate ships, it was just one of several ships in a class called Barquelongs. They included the open boat called Barquelong, the brigantine, the brig and the snow. All of them had two masts and sailed swiftly under both sails and oars. However, whilst media would lead us to believe that they engaged in epic cannon duels, their real strength was in their speed and in chasing down and boarding lightly armed merchants. This made him a worthy, if not superior, contender to the sloop. However, David Cordingly discovered that, between 1710 and 1730, only 10% of pirate attacks were conducted from brigs and brigantines, whereas 45% were conducted in sloops. So, whilst the brig was a great boat, the sloop remains the king of pirate vessels. Huge thanks to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Cole Freer, Max Twick, Captain Dean York, Red Red 88, Michael Jans, Rachel, and Blunderbomb. If you want to support me monetarily, please check out the links to PayPal and Patreon in the description below. Otherwise, please give the video a like and a comment to help the algorithm spread it to more potential viewers. And why don't you share the video with a friend who's into history? Cheers.